Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Tinashe Nyamudoka, internationally celebrated Zimbabwean sommelier and winemaker and the creator of Kumusha Wines. Enjoy this inspirational conversation. Tinashe Nyamudoka, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. You and I have been meaning to do this for a while, and I'm delighted to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, it's great to be here. And now I can have a nice uh, wine o'clock proper one with you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Tinashe, you have uh, an absolutely amazing and inspirational story. And uh, I've been following your story ever since uh, three, four, five years ago and impressed by the things uh, that you, you've been able to achieve the awards that you, you've been able to, to collect, the recognition that you've gotten from the industry at a, at a very tender age of uh, 35. So Tinashe, you were born 35 years ago. Talk to us about where you were born uh, and how you were raised, um, just to get a sense of who Tinashe is. So I was born uh, uh, July 85 uh, in Mount Mallory. Uh, because my mom was a teacher, so she was teaching at Mount Mallory Primary School in Yanga. Mm -hmm. So I, I was born at the hospital and, you know, I think I spent the earlier parts of my years with her in Yanga. Then I moved to Harare, where, where my dad was based. Uh, so my, my father was working for the Simas. He was a, right. a lab technician. So we were staying, literally grew up in Avondale. Uh, and I did my primary school at Avondo Primary School. I did my secondary in Nyanga again, uh, in St. Mary's Magdalene uh, for four years. Then high school, I did at uh, Sandringham, Sandringham High School in Norton. Let's talk now about your first job, uh, you, uh, which is fascinating for me. You become a supermarket uh, picker, basically. You start yes. from right from the bottom. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so, so after high school, the first year, you know, I took it as a gap year. You know, everyone is, I told them I don't want to go to university and stuff. But, you know, that's where the, the UK money and the American money is coming. And, you, you know, you almost forget. And until my aunties were like, you know, dude, you're not going to school. Uh, we can't keep giving you money all the time. And, you know, you, you got to start looking after yourself in a way. You know, with, with an ordinary level certificate and, mm. and a high school certificate, there's not much you can aspire to, to work. But luckily, I had a friend who was a manager at a local TM supermarket. I was like, no, you can come. Uh, I've got some, some pecker position there. So for me, it was, you know, to get extra money, you come home, uh, you could spend time there. But I give credit to him again because, you know, I've even checked him back now. That's try to understand what mm. he saw in me, what he saw in me earlier then, because he said, you know what, you, you, you don't deserve to be at this packing, okay? After a week, I was being told to, to mend the till, I think after a few months from the till, uh, TM started this uh, junior management program, and he said, no, you need to apply, you need to roll into this. So I was put in that very quickly. Uh, in six months' time, I saw myself as tra I was a trainee uh, supervisor, which which really didn't bond well with the older generation there, you know. So most most of the employees were old enough to be my parents, and uh, here's a young guy out of school, getting fast tracked. And you know, I remember at one time there was a big issue, but the only way to silence them was like, you know, what this guy. This boy applied for this program because it needs A levels. None of mm -hmm. you have got even A level. So, yeah, I spent some time there. Then eventually, I was a, I was a, I was a manager. So, what what TM did was they'll, they'll send you in every section. You know, you 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 take some time in the bakery. You spend some time in the purchasing department. You spend some time in the receiving in the warehouse. Uh, so it it was really 
early experience for me uh, without, you know, the, 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 the schooling, proper schooling. So I was learning on the job. So 2008 yeah. happened. You, you yes. decide to pick up and go and go and go to South Africa. Talk to me about that decision yeah. and your first job in South Africa. Yeah, obviously, you know, 2008 was how Zimbabwe was, you know, and I saw it firsthand working in the supermarket. You have money and, you know, the shelves are literally empty. So I had a friend who was in Cape Town. I was like, you know what, with the money you have, you can come in and, and, and start over here, uh, you know. Uh, then because I had saved up a bit, so the first few months were fine. Uh, and by then I'd found out my first girlfriend was also in Cape Town and, and she was pregnant by that time. Mm. And, you know, reality starts to hit home. All that money is running out. Now you start me to, to look for jobs. Uh, but what was happening, I thought, okay, with my experience in the supermarket, I might as well, you know, visit these spas and pick and pay. Uh, and the guys, other guys I stayed around with who were Congolese were working at a local spa. So chatting to them, okay, I was a manager, so I'm going to apply for the manager. Can you put me in touch? And, you know, they gave me this straight look, like, are you serious? You want to apply for a manager's job? And they were straight up, you know, there's, wow. no black manager. there's no black manager in the supermarket. You know, so for me, it wasn't, I wasn't used to that. So I, I didn't understand until I went there. And they told me, you know, you, you, you've got the qualifications, but there's no position for that. But if you want, we've got a baker's position. Uh, yeah, you know, at that time I was like, I'm just gonna take anything. Mm. So you so, took the job, but you were not you were not trained as a baker. So how did you no, no, no. get get to get to become a baker? Uh, so so the, the the guys told me, you know what, you can try this uh, manager position, but we don't think you're gonna get it. But we know there's an available baker. Just tell them you know how to bake bread. Mm -hmm. When you get in, we'll teach you all the stuff. Mm -hmm. But like I say, I, I'd work in a I'd manage a bakery. Yeah. Already. So I, I, I kind of knew how to make the bread because when I was there, I would, I would break with the guys, you know. Uh, bakery used to open up in the morning, so I'll be bored and I'll just help them around until the shop opens. So that's what I told the, 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 the owner. Mm. I, can, I can bake bread. Then he was like, okay, you get the job. You actually say that this humbled you because you couldn't share with your friends and relatives that you're actually working as a, as a baker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it was. But at some point, I realized, you know what? This is the situation you are in. Mm. You're going to feel better about yourself, you know, when I get anyway. But, you know, I so loved how to make bread. And, you know, in my first month after making my own bread, I went to the manager. I was like, you know, I, I, I know how to make bread now. Can you give me a raise? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right. that guy looked at me. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, you know, this money. I, I think I was getting 850 an hour. And I was like, you know, but the money is like, I need a raise. And credit to him, he gave me a 50 rand raise. So I went back to the guys, like I went to the manager and give me 50 rand, uh, 50 cents raise. And they were like, what? You've been here for three years and you've never got a raise. So that's what I started to question myself. So these guys have been here for five years and this is the money they're getting. It just didn't add up, you know, mm. but I was there. Uh, I was breaking bread. But now what happened was, the friends are staying with, you know, the Zimbabwean community wasn't that big in Cape Town mm. at that point. Mm. So everyone knew each other, what they were doing. And, and the vibe was, you know, people are making money in the restaurants right. because there you get the tips. And, you know, uh, my, my other friend was coming out with, with my whole week's wages in just one night shift. So it, it was a no brainer. Like I need to get a job in the restaurants. So you, you, you had a break in a uh, uh, breakthrough rather. You got a job with a Roundhouse Restaurant, which is an upscale yes, restaurant. Yes, so, in so the interesting way. part was, was, so what would happen is, because I didn't have the restaurant experience, yeah. uh, then, then my friends were like, you know what, we'll draft a CV for you. Uh, you know, how, how we, we, we moderate the CVs, we tailor it. I've worked so and so restaurant for many years, you know, this reference, obviously when they call, they're calling your friend. Uh, so I had, I had that CV and I, I had another CV me, which was like, okay, I'm, I'm breaking bread. So mm -hmm. I would go out uh, in the internet shop after work, throw in the CVs on Gumtree. Yeah, and I'll get interviews for restaurant work, but obviously you can't really bluff yourself if they ask no, you for oysters. Exactly. Yeah. 
So, so I'll get my, I'll sell myself short. They never got the positions until one day this restaurant just gets in my inbox, like, okay, come for an interview. Uh, I went to the interview. I sat there. Uh, so I was, I was a bit worried which, which CV they took. Did they take the, the, the proper one or they took the one I was saying it's a baker? And, and, and we were all set in a, in a group interview. And they all started on the other side. These guys are talking about the restaurant experience, Chardonnay, Sonia Blanc, Shannon. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so by the time they came to me, I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm not sure if you picked up uh, the CV that I'm actually baking bread at the moment. And I was like, yeah, for real. We're seeing you working at the spa yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? I don't have, I've never worked in a restaurant in my life. Uh, all this stuff these people are saying i've never encountered it but all i can say is you guys asked me to come so i'm here and uh if you can give me the job i'm willing to learn and, and you know start from the bottom and you know after the interviews i i got that email back you know you must come for the second interview i went there you say you got the job and the reason you got the job was you're the probably one of the only one who told the truth in that interview it was wow. like very honest and you're the kind of people we're looking for. So what, what did you learn there? What, what did you dining. learn there, your first job in a restaurant? What, what did you learn? What were the most valuable things that you learned? Oh, yeah, the first, first lesson was to literally carry a plate and how to clear a plate. Because you know how they always take yes. them like one year, one year, one year. So I, I had never carried a plate, you know. They, they learned you how to carry a plate and clear. Then obviously now you had to learn the terms uh, oyster, Far gras, you know, we were saying far grass, you know, all this <laughs> melot. So you had to now like fine tune the restaurant etiquette and right. you know. So I literally learned from the back. I was that guy who was polishing the plates and wiping them and giving these guys to pass them around. But I was always watching and I was listening and you know they would give us these tests. Uh, and what what one good they were good about was they had a lovely uh, beverage training program, the Let's Start Lobster guys. So mm -hmm. they would would have this manual of wines and, and they related it uh, to, to animals. Mm. So for instance, they'll tell you a Cabernet Sauvignon is like an elephant, you know, king of the jungle, thick mm. skin, it's, it's bold, you know, you get a Chardonnay, it's like the uh, fish eagle, very colorful. So it was really interesting using those terminologies and I got so hooked up and I used to nail my exams like, you know, my Wow. My IQ so, was so, right. Tinashe, is, is that where your uh, love for making wine and being a sommelier, is that where it started? I wouldn't say so. But, you know, at, at that point, uh, I figured it out, okay, this is what I'm doing. But I was, this, all this education was to equip me as to be a good waiter. Mm. Obviously, I realized if you have a good waiter, you have to know your wines, you have to know your foods. So that you can you can you can sell. But the one thing was I was always an introvert. So even in, in school, I was a, one of the guys who sit at the back or in the middle, never in the front. Yeah. Uh, so I've always been that reserved. And now thinking, I think I, I got into the wine because I needed to be out there and speak. Whereas I was always at the back. At the back. I needed to be out there. So so I think the restaurant in, uh, industry gave me that confidence to stand in front of people and, and to express myself. Mm. Just looking at, it, looking at it now, where I am, I think that's, that's the main reason I went into that environment. And you can't hide away, you have to face the guests, you have mm. to recommend and all that stuff. So for me, th at that point, uh, making wine or was not, was not wasn't your part thing. of the game. Part of the game, yeah, part, part of it was just, I realized if you could sell more wine, your guest check would be high and, and your tip would be high at the end. So it was more of equipping myself mm. to learn the job and understand. You, so you, you leave the, uh, the roundhouse and you go to one and only? No, no, not. I, I worked for another small restaurant, okay. which was also in the top 10. It was called The Showroom. It was, oh, right, yeah. Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. And Bruce Robertson was one of the best chefs then. Very good guy, he's late. Uh, but eventually, I think I only worked there for four months, then it closed down. Uh, and coincidentally, the one and only was opening. Mm. But at that time, I wasn't looking for a job. It, it, we had just closed and the one and only was opening. So the, the lady who interviewed me for the rounders 
was the same person interviewing for the one and only. So he's like, Tanasha, I know your restaurant closed. Please send your CV here. They're looking for, for people. And I was like, okay, I'll just send it. And they called me for the interview, another group interview again. And by then, my wine knowledge was really high. Mm. So the f &B manager who was interviewing had been a head sommelier previously. So he picked up that this guy knows a bit about wine. Mm. And was like, okay, just hold on a bit. I'm going to call someone. So he went to call uh, the head uh, sommelier, who was the group sommelier for one and only. So he'd mm -hmm. come from Dubai. He's like, you need to speak to this guy. I'm like, hold on, guys, what's happening here? He's like, no, no, we're going to put you on the wine team. You know, you're going to work with these guys. I was like, no, 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 I'm here for a waiter position. So by then on, you know, your mind is so blue that waiters make more money. So mm -hmm. this other stuff doesn't really matter at all. Uh, the only way they confuse isn't that, not... isn't that fascinating, Tinashe? Yeah. That, that you yeah. are there and you don't realize that actually this is a crossroad. You yeah. choose to be a waiter and you miss your destiny and your purpose. But this I, th man, I think yeah, this man actually forced you towards your purpose. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's literally what happened, and and I feel that's 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 what's been happening in Cape Town, or mm. I don't know, probably elsewhere over, like. People end up in waitering jobs, but realize most of the time it should be a stepping stone, generally. Mm -hmm. Back in the days, waitering in Cape Town was a student at, at UCT, trying to get some pocket money. It wasn't a really uh, big profession, and then the Zimbos and, and made it really, you know, a profession. So at the back of my mind, I realized, okay, this is going to end, but to get there. So... One and only taught me that. And eventually, obviously, they convinced me to be on the mm. wine team. Mm. That's where I realized, okay, there's, there's a sommelier. And, you know, one and only has a, had a massive seller back then. I think we had a collection of almost 8,000 bottles. You know, that's more than 100 different labels. So me trusting to that, I got excited. I was like, okay, yeah. this is something. There's an opportunity. And obviously, I, I had good mentors back then. The, the senior sommeliers, Andre Becker, Eric Potter, you know, they really instilled that love of, of, of the profession because they really handled it well. That's, you know, that's where I saw the guys with the jackets and the pins. I was like, I want to be those guys, you know. So those but let me start guys, here. So guys, I started. So those guys influenced your move to become, to, to love wine and to become a sommelier. Is that what you'd say? You'd say? Yeah, yeah. Especially Andre Becker, you know. Mm. I, I struck on very well with him just the beginning because, you know, I would, I would pamper him. Andre, I'm asking these questions about why, you know, you get frustrated until you're so used to it, you know. So even working, you know, during service, because the wine cellar was so vast, I would get an order, uh, then you send me to fetch the wine. But I would take time to come fetch the wine and you'd come at me shouting, you know, all the time you're telling me, Tinashe, if you can't find the wine, come back to me so I can, but I, I never wanted to leave the, the, the wine cellar without a wine. Mm. So, cause I, I just needed to understand. So, you know, we struck up and he first take me into the, the, the program. So I was literally wine waiter in two months time. I was a wine butler. Uh, in three months time, I was junior sommelier. Uh, and he's the one who led me to go and, you know, enroll in Cape Wine Academy, WSET and, and make it a profession proper. Mm. Uh, so, you know, so one and only opened in 2009, then the World Cup came, uh, and after the World Cup, you know, there was a lot of restructuring, and most of the guys left, Andre left, and I was still there, because I was still growing, I couldn't leave, so mm. uh, new guys came in, uh, Luvon Tezo, uh, so I worked with Gordon Ramsay, mm. of the you know, the Hell's, the Hell's tell, Kitchen Tell me guy. about working with Gordon Ramsay. Tell me about that experience as briefly as possible. Well, I'll say he was never there. I think he only came twice <laughs> during the operation of the restaurant. Yeah, but, but I think that, that the restaurant itself, the way it was well run was, mm. you know, it introduced me to different foods. Uh, that's where I also started to learn about the Wagyu beef, you know, the Kobe, because you'd sell that piece for 800 rands. It was so intriguing. Like, okay, how, why is this beef so expensive? And you learn about it. So th that was Gordon Ramsay then. Yeah, it became that until at the time where, you know, I couldn't grow much more because there was a, a head sommelier there for me. And I, it is that time, you know, I was really frustrated. Uh, I needed to grow, but I wasn't growing. My money wasn't changing. 
Uh, and now, I think I was third year, yeah, almost finishing third year, my accounting degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, I was also pushing my, my studies, like, you know what, guys? Then you're, you're pushing this, your uh, study as a, as a sommelier, a qualified sommelier. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Right. So, yeah, then I said, guys, you know what? Uh, I don't see myself in this wine. Uh, so I literally, there was a position. So the hotels always put positions in every department. And there was a uh, accounts clerk needed. I was like, okay, let me switch to accounts. So I went to, to the finance department. I put my CV and I said, oh, you're doing an undergrad. Okay, we'll, we'll interview. Then they gave me the job to be, uh, 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 to work in the creditors, you know, the purchasing department. Because mm. you're doing wine, okay, we'll send you to, because you're so familiar with. Yeah, and, and uh, after a week, the FNB guys were like, is Tinashe on leave or where is he? And people told them, no, he's working <laughs> in the finance now. And uh, yeah, so they had to convene a, a meeting, the FNB guys and the management is like, okay, what's the problem? I'm like, guys, I came to you, I needed a raise. You guys didn't give me a raise. You know, I can't grow here uh, because, you know, and at that time, I have to say, it, you know, there was a sommelier who was riding high. Mm -hmm. uh, he was mm -hmm. the top of the So there the was top. no position. He was the there. darling of the industry. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, when, when you kind of feel like you, you know the job better, but you, you can't because of, of, of things. I was like, that's the reason. And they said, okay, what you're going to do? So the one and only had Ruben's restaurant on one side. That Nobu restaurant on the other side will say, okay, we're going to put you in Nobu. So you're going to be the sommelier in the Nobu restaurant. So they almost but separated. Before you got your qualification. Was this before you got yes. your qualifications? Okay. Yeah. Before I got the qualification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they said, okay, you know, we're going <laughs> to take you back from, from the finance department and you're going to go back there. That's so at that point, I realized when 13, uh, there was a competition which was started in, in, in SA. It was called the Inter Hotels Show Cook Challenge. So mm -hmm. every hotel had to nominate an aspiring wine sommelier and a mm -hmm. chef. Then you'd compete with the other hotels in, in South Africa. I think at that time there were 15 hotels. So I went, you know, I did the competition and I was the inaugural winner for, wow. for that year, 2013. Nice. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I also got a bursary to finish my diploma at the Cape Wine Academy and a whole lot of uh, accolades which came about. So obviously the profile raised again. Mm -hmm. uh, then, for, yeah, I, I, I managed very well uh, for a period of time. Then I realized, you know what, there was an opening at the Oyster Box, you know, hotel uh -huh. in Shannon. Yeah, I just, in Durban. Yeah, then I, then I just, yeah, I just applied and yeah, they said we've got the job for you here. And I told but the you, guys didn't last, you didn't last a long time in, in Devon uh, uh, at the Oyster. You lasted 18 months and you left for uh, yeah, the yeah, test yeah. chicken, uh, sorry, the test uh, kitchen. Yes, yeah, so the um, test kitchen. Right. Yes. And, and your, your manager at the Oyster wanted to double your salary when you said you're going to leave. But you said, no, I'm leaving yeah. nonetheless. So talk to me about that. Yeah. Leaving uh, a doubling of your salary for the test uh, kitchen. Yeah, obviously going, I knew Cape Town was where everything was going on. And Oyster Box was more for chance and, and the space. I was just frustrated. But back, at the back of my mind, I knew I was going to come back to Cape Town or Johannesburg. So I was there and fortunate, you know, the, the test kitchen opened up. And me knowing the test kitchen is the best restaurant in the world and the opportunities, I, I just balanced it out. It's one of those, you, you know... The decisions you have to make, uh, some, it didn't make a financial sense, honestly, at that time. So I was mm. open to them, you know what, guys, thanks for the money, uh, but I'm really, there's something I'm onto. You know, I, I, I didn't know it was going to blow this, but I had a feeling, you know, you, your gut feeling tells you this, this, is, this is it, you should take it. When you look back now, um, Tinashe, with the benefit of insight, that leaving uh, the oyster, um, uh, box in the oyster box in, in Devon was was perhaps a huge career change for you going to the taste uh, test kitchen. Um, talk to me now about you because I see that Luke Dale Roberts looms large in your life. 
um, uh, it appears it was a big influence to you in terms of who you have, you have, you have now become? So look, Dale is, is you know, he's, I think part of his understanding was he's also British. So he was a foreigner in South Africa. So he can't understood these dynamics. But I think in nature, he's a guy who's, who's a good chef, the best I've ever worked with. You know, I don't think I'll even come close in working with someone better than him in terms of pure mm. gifted in, in cooking. Is that mm. good? Uh, but he's, he's a kind of person who you learn from afar, you know. I, you, you never speak to him much often, but you learn what he does. And mm. you look at the, for instance, uh, last year in the Eat Out top 20 restaurants, you know, you'd get Test Kitchen maybe number one. Then you get in the top 10, there are four chefs who've worked under him mm. who are top chefs in the So, you know, he, he's that kind of guy who natures. Uh, and, and the first thing he told me is like, Tinashe, I see your ambition. I really love your ambition uh, and I'm not going to do anything to, to get in the way of it. But I just need you to understand that you have to know where your bread is being buttered. That's it. And that was his exact words. For me, it was, you know, he's a boss who's understanding what I want to do and is willing to help me and, and trust me with his beverage program. You know, you work in other establishments, they're telling you, you need to bring this wine. No, I don't like this wine. And, you know, Luke would be like, it's all up to you, you know. The only way we chat is, is when we talk talking about wine pairings mm. or you literally beg in his own restaurant for me to list a wine because a friend of his went behind his back. He's like, no, I'm not expecting you to list it, but if you think it's good. And mm. this is someone who's owning the business, but it's wow. trusting. So for me, it was a burden. So mm. I was literally running the, the beverage program like, like it's my own. Mm. Like if I, if I don't get a good deal, I'll, I'll feel like it's coming from my pocket. Mm. So that's Mm. That that's what he does. He 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 gives you, ideas, but it does. It makes you, you know, build on them. Mm. Talk, talk to me now, uh, Tinashe, about the qualifications that you've had. What you've had to go through uh, to be the kind of celebrated sommelier uh, that you are right now. Um, what qualifications have you had to do? So it's it's quite you know it's it's one of those you know debates in the industry is like yeah. what is the proper qualification of a sommelier in South Africa whereas me so I was the kind of guy who looked of the people who were in front of me okay so and so is a sommelier so and so is a sommelier then I, I started realizing this guy is a sommelier but he doesn't have all the qualifications but he is top mm. so in a sense for me it meant like you can literally do the job uh, and be good, good at it without yeah. the whole proper qualifications. Then you had someone who had like the proper qualification but was the worst sommelier on the floor. Mm. So for me, I was like, and there's no one school that you go like in accounting standards that you yeah. then define the sommelier. Of course, there is the court of master sommelier, which is really far from us, especially in Africa, mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's Europe or America based and it's quite expensive. Then in South Africa, you had the Cape Wine Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, then you had the WSET. So you, 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 got, you got a qualification from the Cape Wine Academy? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I, I first got my wine diploma with, uh, mm -hmm. with the Cape Wine Academy. So it, it trains you to be a sommelier in a way. Mm -hmm. But the sommelier purist will tell you, no, you need to get the cost of master sommelier, mm -hmm. which was even made popular by the movie Som and the, the current documentary on Netflix, Uncopped. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the other route. So uh, you, did you get that then, too? Uh, I've got, because it's, it's levels, you know, you okay. get introductory, you get certified, you get advanced. So I'm, I'm certified, but I'm yeah. still to do the advanced and, and, and uh, uh, what you call this? The MS. Okay. Then you get the master of wine. So there's so many different rules. But for me, what I realized was what works best for me was everyone was really concentrating on one, you know, trying to do the one and finishing. Whereas I took all possible routes mm. and almost done everything, everything to a certain point. So if you'd ask, do I have a WSET? I have it. You ask, I have a Cape One Academy? I have it. I have a Court of Master? I have it. Whereas other sommeliers just have one. So that's, and, that's, and that's you also... Have, you do have a business management uh, uh, diploma. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you've got a postgraduate bachelor for accounting, uh, and then you've got uh, a postgraduate in um, uh, judging. Wine, 
Yeah, when, so the accounting, during my time in Durban, you know, I was doing long distance learning with UNISA. So in Cape Town, I had a proper study group. So it was helping more. When I went to Durban, I'd lost that study group. Mm. And I think I was left with three modules to finish my accounting degree. Yeah. Uh, at that time, I was also pushing to finish my Cape Wine diploma. So mm. it was a so lot. Let me, let me just hold you there, Tanasha. I, I, want, I, want, I want this for the viewers to understand the qualifications that you have. So let's go through what yeah. you've got. Um, what, 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 what is it that you have? So I have a, a diploma with the Cape Wine Academy. Mm -hmm. I have a WSET, which is the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. It's London-based for level three. Mm -hmm. And I'm yet to do the diploma. Mm -hmm. And I've got the cost of master's uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. I've got a certificate. So I literally got it last year because it was the first time they held uh, exams in, in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. So previously, you had, had to travel to either Europe or America to get that certification. Uh, I also have a wine judging certificate mm -hmm. with a micro -frigion. Then I have a postgraduate uh, diploma with... Uh, UCT Graduate School of Business, Wine mm -hmm. Business Management. Mm -hmm. uh, and what else? Yeah. Okay. I think that's and, it. And because of that, you, I mean, because of that knowledge and the experience that you've acquired, you've built a brand uh, around you. Uh, Tinashe yeah. is now a recognized uh, uh, and celebrated uh, sommelier throughout the world. You have won a number of awards, uh, Tinashe. Can you walk us through those awards that you've, that you've won? Yeah, obviously, the biggest one was uh, much fulfilling was the Eat Out Awards, you know, the, the best restaurant in South Africa, then you give the best service. Uh, that was one big one. And obviously, 2013, my uh, wine sommelier steward of the year. Uh, yeah, and probably those are the biggest one. I was once voted one of uh, 100 aspiring South Africans with a young uh, independent organization. Uh, that was in 2016. Uh, yeah, in terms of awards, probably those are the ones that stand out. And you're a member of the board of uh, the Black Seller Club. What is that? Yes. So Black Seller Club was started by a group uh, of, of, of Zimbabweans, actually. So mm -hmm. it started off of, you know, you're realizing that a lot of top restaurants in South Africa and mostly uh, establishments I have but like qualified wine people, you know, like, okay, can't we start an association of like-minded people? So I, I was part of that front to push for the Zimbabwe sommeliers in South Africa. No, it was so that's, just that's, what, that, that's what this group is all about, <laughs> Zimbabwe and sommeliers in South Africa. So then it, it went on with, with other interested parties, like, oh, working in the, in the host wine, wine industry, like, guys, no, why are you just limiting it to to Zimbabweans only. Uh, let's just, we'll help you with that mean and help you with the marketing and let's just call it black so it encapsulates uh, everyone, not even black people only, but you know, people of all colors. So that's where the group started and it, it was formed to, to teach other people uh, and you know, would arrange wine visits for, for these young upcoming. And then you did the World uh, Blind Wine Testing in 2017 and 20. Uh, 18 and you did you did exceptionally well there talk to me about that was the second year we did well but the first year was yeah it was <laughs> was a disaster so it, it came up yeah it was a disaster it came about again uh i think the the, the tasting championship has always been on uh and you know locally they they do the the championship to get the south african team mm -hmm. uh so 2016 None of us did well, but in 2017, it so happened that in the top 10 of the South African tasting championships, there were four Zimbabweans in the top wow. 10. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And, and we're like, why not fight for one position? Can't we go on our own team? And, you know, so then we found out, okay, we can actually mm -hmm. register a team. And they were so excited that there's a Zimbabwean team coming. So everything was fast tracked, the visas, and uh, we did a crowdfunding where, you know, one of the, probably the second biggest wine critic, Jancis Robinson, she's mm -hmm. based in London, she picked up the story. Wow. It's like, no, this is amazing. I'll start a crowdfunding. So within a month, we had raised 10,000 pounds, enough for us to travel to Europe and go compete. And, you know, for me, it was the first time. Representing Zimbabwe, flying the Zimbabwean flag. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So, wow. so that's where the Zim team came about. How do you explain to Nasha the fact that uh, yeah, there's so many Zimbabwean uh, sommeliers in, in South Africa? Well, I think, obviously, Zimbabweans, when, when they see an opportunity and, and a you know, life-changing experience, you, you tend to gravitate towards that. Uh, and I think it became a phenomenon where I think we were the, probably the kind of the first generation sommeliers in, in South Africa. So it, mm. it almost caused an interest where everyone was saying, okay, there's an opportunity there. We're working with wine. Mm. You've, you can you've do inspired wine. quite a number of people to get into this industry tonight. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Mm. But again, I think the question is why are they good sommeliers yeah. yes. from Zimbabwe? And I think Talk it's got to, to do. So first of all, you know, as a people, the way we survive everywhere in the world is because Zimbabweans are, are resourceful. Uh, you know, we, 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 we learn. And every, everyone I know in South Africa, you know, they started somewhere and they literally built their careers from the, if he was a mechanic, now he's owning his own, you know, company. If he was working in finance, now he's owning his company. So I think Zimbabweans are generally like that. I ended up in wine, but realized what possibilities I can get whilst I'm there. And that's how I became what I am. Now, let's talk about this, Tinashe. <laughs> Kumusha <Wano. laughs> what an idea. Um, again, yeah. Goes to show yeah. the kind of person that you are, tenacious, uh, adventurous, uh, creative. What, what caused you to create this wine? Just talk to me about that. So Kumusha wine came to, you know, remember I told you I was in Durban. And the friends I was playing with were literally starting their own companies, like I was mentioning now. You know, yeah. a friend was a mechanic, he had quit his job, he's opened his own enterprise. And you had these guys who had been working but realized, as you know what, we're not going to go back home soon. We'd rather mm -hmm. create our own lives. Cheers. Yeah. So there Cheers. was that movement. Cheers, <laughs> Cheers. 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 Sure. sure. <clears throat> so there was that movement. Yeah. And for me, I was like, okay, I'm in the wine industry, but I need something that I can, what business is there? So I realized, okay, people are saying there's three, three million Zimbabweans in South Africa. And I, I was checking on the Facebook page, you know, there was Zimbabweans in Cape Town was 30,000, you know, Zimbabwean mm -hmm. professionals in Cape Town, 20,000. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, in my mind, <clears throat> if I can teach these Zimbabweans about wine, you know, I could sell some, something somehow. So I started this group called Wine263 on Facebook and most of the time now I realized I was just speaking to myself. No one <laughs> understood where I was on. So but I, I just wanted to be a voice of, of the Zimbabweans. I realized there's a lot of Zimbabweans working in restaurants. I just wanted to create a platform where, you know, it was about Zimbabweans. So no one but bought tell, the, the tell idea. Me about, let's let's talk about the wine. Let's talk about the wine. So you the, the idea you you, st you start tweeting about it and, and uh, Facebook and that kind of stuff and finally a product is there, Kumusha wine, yeah. perhaps one of the yeah. most uh, celebrated um, wines by uh, a Zimbabwean uh, uh, sommelier. And uh, shall I call you a winemaker? Are you qualified to be called a winemaker? No, no, so, not a winemaker at all. So, yeah. Sommelier, but you've, you've, you've yeah. created a wine. Talk to me yeah. about Kumusha and the, the, the way you started it, why you started it, and how it is doing now. So, in the end, you know, I realized wine is a culture, you know. After traveling Spain, Italy, France, the, the theme is the same. Wine is a culture. They don't, they don't take wine as, a, as, a, as an alcohol drink just to get drunk. Wine is connected to their place. Uh, it's built cities, like in France, Bordeaux is built around wine. You know, Germany, Mosul is built around wine. And, and certain food, you know, define wine in different areas. So it, it's, it's a cultural expression in a way. And when I understood it, it so happened to, you know, when we smell wine, mm -hmm. especially this side, it's still in European terms, you, you must smell gooseberry. So this wine, for instance, in European yeah. terms, I'll say you're picking up bright peaches, some mandarin, some apricots, you know, some gooseberries. But what if you've never smelled a gooseberry? How are you going to pick it up? Yeah. But the thing is, you know, wine is, is, is expressed in a European way. So I struggled to, a bit. To pick up those you know exotic fruits i was i grew up eating matamba maroro you know hute kumusha you know and and, and somehow i'll pick those stuff up 
but at that point I didn't know it, if it was you know safe to say I'm smelling marore in my wine and there was no one every every tasting was was either Africans or, or, or English so but at some point through reading a book which 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 almost changed and defined the Kumusha way it's, it's called Liquid Memory mm-hmm. it's written by Jonathan Nozieta you should actually find if you're a good reader you enjoy reading it he was a former sommelier uh, who ended up being a wine writer and movie movie producer so in one chapter he says you know what wine they say wine is a cultural expression and wine is origins. So when we say the origins of wine, we mean where the wine is being made, yeah. uh, you know, the environment, the, the climate, the geography, that, that's what defines wine. So when I'm smelling this wine, mm. if I'm a professional, it really takes me to where it's being grown. I can literally smell the, the okay, soil, this is in the, valley. the soil, the soil. The, 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 the texture, the, the, the environment, altitude, you know, you, you can literally taste this wine is coming from a cool climate or warm climate. Mm, mm. So, but then the problem with me was, okay, you, you're expecting me to, 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 to go to a place I've never been, to a mozo. It doesn't make sense, but when I smell this wine, you know, I'm reminded of, of Kumusha Nasekuru, you know. Uh-huh. I remember that Matamba tree, I is, remember is that, that. Is that what this wine does for you, Kumusha? Yeah, yeah, every wine. So every wine to, to so, so wine, when, it, when it's the chemical part is, when it's fermenting, it, it releases those spinels. So because we don't have anything to associate with that, so everyone associate with the fruits or whatever stuff you can smell. You can literally, some other wines, you can smell cow dung. Mm. Some other wines, especially in New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc, it smells like cat's pee. Mm. But it's not like there's cats be inside, but you know, those, so, so wine is a sensory, it's all about memory, it's all mm. about experiences. So mm. when you smell a wine, it has to remind you of something you've experienced before. So mm. me, it was taking me back home. I was like, okay, now I've got the opportunity to create my own label. Uh, I, I know you don't have a red, so I'm going to show off by, uh, <laughs> you know, pouring uh, your red. I think this is... Uh, a, a cab serve. This is your cab serve. Yes, uh, it's a cab serve and sinso. Serve, it's a cabernet sauv. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, um, it's a cabernet sauv young and sinso. Beautiful. Uh, meant beautiful. to be elegant, structured. You know, not overbodied. I wanted something which was accessible in its youth, and you could you know cellar it for a while. Uh, but then again, you know, coming to the naming of the wine, for me, it just said, okay, this wine is reminding me of home. I'm just gonna call it Kumusha. And I remember, you know, talking to my other friends, like, guys, this is what I wanna call the name. It's like, no, but you should name it in English. You know, people understand it better. But I was like, you know, I, I barely understand most of the wine labels I read, the French, the Germans, the Africans. So it's not in the name per se, but it's in the, in the expression of it. So I just mm-hmm. stuck up to it. And on the label, you know, all these big wineries, because they've got history of land and everything. They always put maybe their driveway or maybe a piece of the mountain or they mm. put their house. And for me, I was like, you know, I'm just going to put my house. And you, know, and, and you, you say go, this is your, your Sekuru's house. This is your yeah. um, uh, home in, uh, in the Eastern Highlands. Nyanga. And Nyanga. Yeah. This is so where obviously your... it's changed a bit, but yeah. I was fortunate enough to get an old picture. Yeah. So I just went to a guy who designed it for me. And for me, it was something to connect, you know. So I always say I, I, I'm selling wine, but I, I'm, I'm not literally selling wine. For me, I'm selling an experience. I'm selling. So, you know, when, when it got out, people were like either surprised that, you know, there's a Zimbabwean wine called Kumusha or other people thought the wine was being made in Zimbabwe. But it was all in the name and mm. all in the picture. So for me, it was so that you, you've got way right of expressing now, myself. You, we've got uh, the Melo. You've got yeah. the Shannon Blanc. You've got the Cab Sav. And, and which one? So actually, I have the white blend, yeah. which you're drinking now, and yes. the red blend. Yeah. Uh, those are the two I started off. So I tried another project where I did a Merlo, Sauvignon Blanc, and a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm-hmm. which I'm not going to do again because yeah, the project didn't go out well. Okay. Uh, I think I tried to grow too much, uh, which, you know, it was really losing the, what I wanted to achieve mm-hmm. with it. So I trimmed it back. So going forward, I'm going to produce this white blend and the red blend. And obviously maybe in September, come up with the Sauvignon Blanc. 
Mm -hmm. And how has uh, Kumusha Wines, uh, how have they performed? How has the, the brand performed? Well, the brand is, is performed very well, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet. It's become with its own challenges as well, you know. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges? The, Talk to me about the, the challenges, the, uh, Tunashe. So for me, the biggest challenge has been, you know, getting people to really appreciate and, and you know, feel comfortable drinking the wine, you know. More or less, they'll be saying, okay, this is by Zimbabwe, maybe some other mediocre stuff. And people will barely not drink it because of that. So the challenge has been, you know, trying to get it as authentic as possible. Obviously, I wasn't worried about the wine quality. About, I was worried about the perception, of which I have, it's been big perceptions where, you know, people just don't drink it because it's, it's a Zimbabwean wine. And, mm. and the most other difficult part has been the distribution. You know, mm. you, you're sitting with cases of this wine, but there's someone who happens to find about it in, in, in America. How do you mm. get that person, mm. that bottle of wine? How do you get, you know, even the ones you've had, you know, they, mm. they haven't been easy to get to you. So we, that's we're not the going to tell challenge. the story of how we got them, but uh, we got them. <laughs> yes. You know, so, so it's, it's from a traditional point of view, these big wineries, they've got the distribution network, so they mm. can get... A certain so wine, you're, you're, a certain exactly wine what you're saying uh, to me, uh, Tinashe, is uh, marketing challenges, uh, distribution problems, uh, brand recognition and brand, brand yes. acceptance by, by, by yeah. the market. Are you overcoming those? Yes, slowly but surely. Uh, yeah. with obviously, with careful marketing and the wine being reviewed and tasted and being drunk with people, and they genuinely love it. And it's all been by, you know, word of mouth. That's why I say word of mouth is my oxygen because mm -hmm. I haven't paid brand uh, advertisements and, you know, placing it there. It's just been word of mouth. People are appreciating and understanding the story, mm -hmm. connecting with the brand and sharing it and recommending it. That's how I've won. Uh, so the marketing side, and it's been, it's been starting to get accepted, which is quite very good. Uh, but I think that the challenge now is just the, uh, distribution and, and making you know people get it easily it's been very fulfilling and very touching where some zimbo in america or in canada i'd be like geez we saw your wine how can we get the wine so it's been accepted in that way and what i guarantee is that the quality is as good as you can get so i'm not worried about that so i think it's, it's been accepted uh, I, I can uh, you know you haven't paid us to do this show uh, and you haven't paid me to to uh, to endorse this uh, wine. I think uh, yes. to, I, I got a badge uh, in 2019. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, yes. I fully recommend this uh, this yeah. uh, the commercial wine. It's, it's a good wine. And you know, Trevor, with with because I'm 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 a regular wine judge in in South Africa. So I judge for all the top wine competitions in South Africa. Uh, and I'm also an international judge, so I judge in Germany. So just recently, before the COVID struck in February, I was judging as a Zimbabwean judge in, in you were Germany. You were the only black person there. Uh, yeah, uh, out, of, out of close to 260 judges from all yeah. over the world. So, sure. so my my wine. So to to explain it a bit, I actually don't grow and and make the wine. Uh, Winemaker for me from Opstal called Ati does the wine fine growing and then the. And the vinification but what i'm good at is i'm good at blending mm -hmm. i'm tasting so i go into the cellar I like give me that barrel 20 percent 10 percent of this five percent of this then i i blend my own my own taste and my own expression mm -hmm. so it answers your question i'm not a winemaker at all mm -hmm. and i don't pride myself in winemaking i'm a good blender mm -hmm. so i do all in wine judging i know if the wine is balanced if the wine is expressive and that's what i'm good at as well Mm. Talk, talk to me now about, um, I'm, a, I'm somewhat biased. Uh, mm. when a, a bottle of wine doesn't have a, 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 Natural has cokes. a, a, a doesn't have a Coke, uh, yeah, yes. I, 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 it puts me off. So I realize uh, that for your, for your whites and for your reds, you, you don't have a, a screw on. What do you call screw it? Cap, yeah. uh, screw cap. Screw cap. You, you yeah. have... Um, uh, cooks for for all of them, which is which is beautiful. Yeah. Why have you gone uh, this way? Well, one of the thing is the perception. I suppose. Aha, okay. Yeah, so, so it's a, it's a lot of people uh, who perceive that you know once you put a, a screw top on it, it's bad wine. But you know that that myth has been debunked. I've been in tastings where 
wine is being poured from a cork, from a bottle. And so you know, people usually pick the wines from the screw cap. So at the end know, of the day... You know what? On that point, for me, that has not been debunked. I'm still one of those people who <laughs> go into, into yeah. a place to buy wine. And if there's a screw top, I'll skip it yeah. and get to one yeah. which is... There. But that's, that's but interesting. That's, yeah. But but then again, like I say, you know, wine is not just your average drink. Wine is an experience, you know. I enjoy that ceremony of, you know, cutting the foil, putting yeah. my cork yeah. through and so it is part of the ceremony. To open and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's part of the part ceremony. Of the, the, the the ceremony of enjoying the wine. Yeah, enjoyment. If you were to ask me personally, I also prefer wine in a in a cork. Well, so. And 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 you uh, have a dream for uh, making this uh, a huge brand on the continent. Uh, talk to me yeah. about that briefly. You want to sell a million bottles on the continent? Yeah, I think, you know, with the way things are going and, you know, Africa, we've always been looking outwards and never inside. And the other thing, what the test kitchen has, has taught me and, you know, I, I got to know more food after wine. Just working at the test kitchen, appreciating the food and you know, I don't think much attention is given to the way of cooking our mothers or grandmothers used to do. Uh, it's said that most of the chefs are not continuing that tradition, whereas the European guys are starting to cook with fire, stuff we should have been doing. And for me personally, growing up, it was the same thing. Sadzaniyama, my veggie. And are you going to move us into uh, beginning to appreciate the importance of pairing our wine with our food? Uh, is that what yeah, I think is? I think you, I think you can't you can't have a conversation of wine without the food part of it. It's right. part of the culture. Everywhere you go, you know, food and wine has to be had at the same time. If you really appreciate wine, you have to have food and wine. And you know, it's the same. People don't understand food as much, especially working in in the restaurant, which is much more European. And 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 you know, not saying the other. I, I'm I'm. I like the fact that young black chefs are starting to get into the kitchen and being creative. Uh, but I think most of the time is they're trying to make the plate look good mm. uh, and it's all about the likes. But, but few of them, you know, what Lucas has, has taught me is like, Tinashe, when I cook, I'm thinking about growing up, what I used to eat, what my mother used to make. And at the end of the day, food is fulfilling. Whereas I find nowadays, you know, young guys, chefs are coming, they're making the plate nice, it looks nice, it's Instagrammable. But you, when you have it, it's, it doesn't give you that feeling. You know, Trevor, when, when you've been missing a plate of salsa, yeah, and you finally have that salsa, that satisfaction of like, you know. So what, what the Europeans done is, as much as the food looks fancy on the plate, it still gives them that taste of satisfaction. Where I feel, you can't tell me I'm gonna be satisfied eating some grilled prawns or, or exotic salmon. You know, you're just gonna, it's a crave. You know, I see my chef making a Madora sauce and I'm like, it tastes very good, but most of our guys are not even incorporating in their cooking. So mm. it's, it's one of the drives I, I tend to, to, to foster as well. Mm. And it's also being helped with the Kumusha wine because mm. I can bring up that conversation of, okay, what, what if, mm. We go back in time, go to the Gogos who are still alive, ask them how they prepared the food. Uh, maybe we can, and not maybe, I'm sure we can get stuff to create our own cuisine. We don't have to invent the wheel, but I think we can change our cooking methods. You know, it's, it's not about designing the sadza in a hot shape or making it fancy. Leave it that way, but make it much more tasty in a different way. So I think that's where my passion is moving towards slowly. Uh, incorporating wine, every beverage, coffee, for instance, as well, you know. And I see you're talking about your grandfather, who is uh, 90, she's, he's 95. Is he 95 or 90? Yeah, he's, he's 90 this year. 90 this year. Still has a piece yeah. of land out in the Eastern Highlands. And you're thinking of coming yeah. home. Is that what you're thinking of coming home? And you're thinking of coffee, too? Is that where your destiny is? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, I've set my mind up. I know it's, you know, it's, it's daunting at the environment, but when, when your soul is yearning something, you know, being me, I can't fight it. You know, I just have to drive it. I, I feel now even on Twitter, I'm connected with a lot of young farmers. You know, every on Twitter, I see this one as a, like Kuda, you know, fresh in a so box. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, for me, it excites me that there are people really putting the, 
the effort in growing the stuff. But where I feel the gap is, you're gonna grow that stuff, and most of the time people are selling it, but no one is bringing the the food from the farm to the table. You know, everyone is growing to sell. No one is is, is joining in between. Where I see here, most of the top restaurants they are not buying from commercial farms. They're buying from these smaller individuals. So I just feel. I haven't lived in Zimbabwe for the past 10 years, but I just feel the restaurant culture is still not there. If it's there, it's buying imported food and not really growing what we have in the backyard. So eventually that's why I see all my energy and efforts being put in. I would love to go to these rural areas if they are growing sesame seeds, sazarimunga, big small plot of coffee from my grandmother and bring it to town and, and, and celebrate it and embrace it, you know. Food and wine. Yeah. Yeah. Food and so, wine in the culture. In the culture. So home is calling, Tinasha. That's what I'm get I'm getting. Home is calling you. Yeah. yeah. Back, uh, it's yeah. calling even louder now. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. You say you're sixty percent there. Um are you still sixty percent there in terms of moving back? No, nine, 98, wow. 99. Wow, that's fascinating. 98, that's fascinating. That's ex that's, that's I, I haven't figured it out well, but you know, Trevor, when, like I was saying, I've been following quite a lot of guys. I see a lot of chefs doing their own things, uh, especially the farmers. You know, I see a lot of young farmers, you know, this guy posting with his head of cut you know, Hopo has his goat farm, mm. you have your goats, you've got mm. your tomatoes, but I just don't see people celebrating that produce and bringing it on the table, on the table. and enjoying it. Yeah, so I feel maybe guys like us who have been schooled down here, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying out of arrogance, but it's a fact that Cape Town is, is a food destination by itself. You know, people literally come to Cape Town for holiday knowing they're going to the test kitchen mm. after visiting Table mm. Mountain of which I feel I've spent a lot of time in, in Zim restaurants, hotels, Victoria Falls. And, you know, as much as we, we, we say we've got the falls, our country is beautiful, but the traveler nowadays is not just going to a destination to see the falls. Mm -hmm. After the falls, they want to eat better because they've eaten better. They want to drink better. Whereas I think the Zim at the moment is just focusing on getting people to come and see the Victoria Falls. Whereas Cape Town is saying, come see the Table Mountain, but we've got the uh, 54th bestest restaurant, 20th best restaurant in the world. You can eat in that too. So I think you can get away for now. But interesting for you, Trevor. So when I was working at the test kitchen, 90% yeah. uh, of the guests are foreign. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they probably coming from Victoria Falls, then come to Cape Town and live, or they come from Cape Town, they're going to Victoria Falls. Mm -hmm. And most of them will be like, no, we in Victoria Falls, I say, oh, which side? The Zimbabwe side. Oh, you had a great time. Yes, but ah, the food, yeah, wasn't so good. Uh, every, every, every guest I met, okay, well, it's lovely, but the food and the wine is the same. So at so some point... For, for some people who don't know the test kitchen, um, Tinashe, you know, it, it takes uh, maybe a year or six months to try and get a table at the test kitchen. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you I've know, it's a, foot a number of times and uh, what a beautiful place it is. Uh, Tinashe, it's been absolutely wonderful uh, talking to you. You have inspired quite a lot of young people uh, to, uh, to get into the profession that you are in right now. You've inspired a lot of uh, young Zimbabweans to want to get into business because they can see the clean uh, and successful way that you've been able to notch all the achievements that you have. So I'm going to say cheers to you, uh, uh, Tinashe. Uh, uh, cheers to Kumusha. Uh, we cheers. Wish cheers. you, Kumusha, all the very best and that your dreams uh, to come back home and uh, create a tourist product that's going to attract more tourists. That is if we are over this uh, uh, thing. So Coffee. thank you so much for coming into In Conversation with Trevor. Allow me now to turn to our viewers who are all across the continent, who are in the diaspora, uh, all over the world for watching In Conversation with Trevor. And to invite you to subscribe to our, our YouTube channel by clicking onto this little red button so that you, don't, you never miss out on these uh, quality conversations.
So until next time, cheers. Thank you.